We need the city to start investing in the city uh, and reinvesting in our communities that are already here that can benefit and draw more people and accept more people to benefit from existing infrastructure or upgraded infrastructure instead of focusing on, on new infrastructure. I'm John Lewis, and you're listening to 360 Degree City, a podcast where we talk to people who are working to make cities better. Our hope is that after each episode, you'll start to see your own city from a slightly different angle. 360 Degree City is brought to you by the team at Intelligent Futures. We're a team of versatile urban problem solvers, and our aim is to figure out better ways of living together. Developers play a key role in shaping the landscape of a city. Oftentimes, however, when we talk about the future of our cities, the voices of those folks that build the places where we live and work and play aren't considered. And that includes this podcast to date. So we wanted to fix that. In many North American cities, residential development has created a city that continually sprawls outwards. And this has been the case in Calgary, where the city is not constrained by many natural boundaries that limit growth. New communities featuring auto-oriented development with primarily single detached homes, winding roads and grassy lawns are still very common here. Despite the historical trend to build out instead of up, some developers are reshaping existing neighborhoods by designing higher density homes in existing communities. So today we wanted to talk to a developer who's focusing on thoughtful inner city development. My name is uh, Al Karim Devani. I'm one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of uh, Round Square. Uh, we're an inner city urban development company. We've been doing this for roughly three years. Um, and prior to that, we had been doing strictly kind of infill, semi-detached development. Round Square builds modern homes with an eye on affordability in Calgary's established neighborhoods, which are outside the downtown core. Their designs are often noticeable using a mix of textures, combining metal, cedar, and high contrast black and white details. Many of the units Round Square develops fit into what's called the missing middle. Missing middle is a range of multi-unit housing types that gently increase the density of a neighborhood, which makes it more walkable and affordable often. Think of a fourplex or a townhouse or a live-work unit. These types of medium density homes are often missing in North American cities. So let's dive into my conversation with Al. What sparked you to start Round Square? Yeah, so we had been doing like infill development for over, I would say, almost 10 years solid in Calgary. And so kind of went through the ebbs and flow of 08 and 2014. Uh, We got into infill development because my brother used to do um, suburban development, greenfield stuff out in Elba Valley Estates kind of acreage, high-end, uh, you know, multi-million dollar homes. Uh, when the market dipped in 08, we thought that that got hit the hardest. It was tough. Banks were recalling their mortgages. It wasn't a pretty picture. And that buyer pool got slim to none. And so when when I graduated from University of Calgary, I graduated with a marketing degree. I was watching my brother do all this real estate. I had my real estate license and I was sitting show homes and stuff um, in university. And I just thought, okay, well, like this infill urban idea seems to be uh, a good option for families being wanting to be closer to the core. And at the time, I think infill development, when we first started, was like $650,000 a side. So still reasonably affordable with the median price points. And so, you know, from 08 to um, by the time that we were like looking at a change 2016 2015 we were selling infills like for 1.2 million dollars a side and so we basically hit the pause button again and said okay you know we we were so excited to have like no architectural controls do really cool architectural buildings we were doing them all in house my wife is an architect and our lead designer and it was super fun because i felt like we had changed the expectation of what infill could look like in calgary uh really early on with beyond i think that was one of our goals but then we quickly realized the buyer pool again started to disseminate and who are we serving and what were we serving for purpose um building cool stuff for a small group of people didn't really seem to fulfill a purpose. And so we sat down and we said, okay, like what, what, what is the intent of what we want to do moving forward? Me and my brother were kind of working together at the time, but not really. We had kind of veered off and we, we decided that we wanted to get back together and we wanted to figure out like some core values. And one of them was how do we create affordability uh, within the urban still with a strong foundation in urban and design, But then at the same time, how do we retain families to kind of live this experience? And so 
I'm a huge urban person. I didn't grow up in an urban setting. I grew up in the suburbs. My family migrated here um, as refugees in the 70s. And so I, I really rarely ever went to downtown. I think the first time I had like been to a hockey game was when I was in high school. Um, my parents just downtown wasn't a part of our lives. Like we didn't even really use transit that frequently. It was kind of like very special event focus that we would come there. And so we used to live in a silo. I, I used to call it where now I feel like the urban is so connected. Um, and, and so now it's become a passion, uh, and, of, of driving a way to create more sustainable living and how do we really create more collisions and people interactions. Mm, right. Very cool. And, and so a lot of the work that, uh, that's in the units that, that round square, um, delivers is what, what could be called in that, that kind of missing middle. Uh, can you maybe talk about what you saw as the opportunity and in, in maybe explain the Calgary context as it relates to that for folks that don't know it? Yeah. So I guess like the missing middle term in, in many different parts of the world is conceived in two, in two different tones. And so when we looked at it very contextually for Calgary, what was missing was the opportunity for families to live in ground oriented units within the city of Calgary urban context. And so we saw lots of infill development. We saw a lot of multifamily development. But when we looked at townhomes specifically, and even, you know, we could get into mid rise as well, but specifically right now for the ground oriented family units, we felt like there wasn't, there wasn't a number of options. There wasn't even a zoning criteria, which easily allowed that to happen. And so in 2014, when we first started to look at this as an option, uh, Calgary just had a recent election and we just like literally took a, a shot in the dark at doing a land use redesignation. Um, and, and it was, uh, it was in ward eight with Councillor Woolley. Um, um, and so it was, he was, I think a week on and we were at this rezone and I had been working a ton with the city prior to that and the alderman and everyone had said no, except for the alderman. He said he, he kind of saw the need for it. And then all of a sudden this alderman's not there. We go in front of council. It took like three and a half hours. <laughs> like we're literally taking a zoning of what we usually would have been a semi-detached asking to put four units hmm. on it. And there's four units across the street. And it took three hours and we ended up losing it by one vote. Three yeah, hours. Three hours. And then the alderman that flipped it was, was Councillor Woolley. Um, and so he, I think he came back like literally like not even a week after. Super sympathetic. Felt really terrible about it. But it kind of alluded to this great relationship um, as like I met a ton of people at the city of Calgary it really brought light, the light to the fact that, wait a second, we don't really know how we're addressing, um, you know, this, this kind of family oriented affordable option. And so, um, we worked on a new zoning district. And so, you know, I worked on it with them kind of had been in consultations brought in about what we would like to see. They did a bunch of industry consultation and they rolled out this new district mm -hmm. at that time we knew it was happening. And so we basically went out and bought like 15 to 20 of the ones that we thought would meet the requirements to actually get this district approved. And then, uh, yeah, lo and behold, we're, we're, we're here now and, and rolling out, you know, I think we have 60 units that we will possess this year for mm. ground orientation within the inner city. Great. Yeah. And, and w w with a, with a shift to accommodate more families, cause that's always seems to be the discussion in this city. And I think a lot of others, when you're talking about inner city and then you talk about affordability mm. and the, base conversation is dollars per square foot. So of course the suburbs win when that's the only accounting. For sure. Um, but if, if you start to enable uh, more families to live in these different kinds of units that maybe weren't there, what do you think the, the implications are for the culture of the city? Because one of the things that I, you know, if you take a step back in say the last decade in the city, the urban culture has shifted really substantially and then there's there's a whole bunch of factors there's market there's uh public infrastructure there's all kinds of things but yeah. what, what do you think the the long-term implications would be for the, the culture when i look at the cultural impact of those things i think part of the issue is calgary culturally for the last you know 20 30 40 years um and, and many of these what i'm seeing is a trend in many of these north american cities post uh, world war ii was like there was this idea that you wanted to live you know further away more space, bigger homes, um, bigger backyards, have lots of land. Um, and so the trend became this trend line of putting up these, these sea of, of homes to kind of meet demand of what people were looking for. Um, and so I think part of the issue that we face now is 
things have been so culturally ingrained in what what your expectations are like you grow up by moving into the suburbs is kind of often what I hear. Like I'm growing up, so I'm kind of having to move to the burbs and mm-hmm. I have a family now and it's like, and I, and I got to get that backyard and I got to get that, you know, that 2000 square foot home, even though I don't use it. And so, but that's not true everywhere, I guess. Like you look mm-hmm. at many of the European cities and they're raising families of two to four within, uh, you know, a flat culturally, we just were not built with that mentality to be able to do that. And so mm-hmm. like, I can't even have a conversation at the community level or city level and say, no, like my flats could actually house families. Cause it's like, no, they can't. There's no way. There's no park. You don't have a backyard. Yeah, where's the yeah, dog going to yeah. go? And it's like, well, wait a second. Like majority of the world is not privileged enough to having a backyard and having all the things you have access to. And so isolation to me is what I see as one of the biggest obstacles and opportunities for urbanism is mm-hmm. like the lack of social isolation and the encouragement of interactions and collisions is what what really excites me and so then I hear from other people who are working in the green fields saying, well, we're, we're going to do that in the green fields. Like we're going to create more density out here and more collisions and more walkable communities, which I think is amazing because I think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. I just still don't understand how if we create these pods of places where people can stay and live and work how is our city then connecting is my question. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm not, again, I'm not enough of a, of a trained profession to have that answer, but it does come to mind for me because I feel like I did have that experience as a kid growing up. Like I lived in the Northeast, my parents culturally, like a lot of our, you know, our mosque is in the Northeast. All of the places that we shopped was in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to leave. Like, I, you know, my dad left for work and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then came back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I find it interesting and compelling but with urban i feel like because you're so connected there's so many ways to get access to so many different things that are just what feels like on the peripherals of where you're at that connections are so much more frequent Mm -hmm. i I like even to to many of the successes that i've personally had has been through a coffee shop interaction right like i i choose to go to coffee shops every day um and people are like man why don't you just drink your coffee and it's like (laughs) Because part of me is like always intrigued by what could happen in that instance mm-hmm. of passing someone and having a conversation and what that could then lead to. Yeah, for sure. And there, there's uh, Stephen Johnson has a book called Where Good Ideas or Where Ideas or Where Good Ideas Come From. And he talks about this idea of the adjacent possible. And so new ideas don't leapfrog often. They are what's adjacent to it. And so why cities are um, such and urban places are such good um, laboratories for that is because you exactly as you describe what's just outside of your normal periphery uh but you're you're faced with it in an urban setting probably more than than other kinds of communities yeah so tony Shea said the same thing in his book and that's kind of where he talks about collisions um uh he mentioned the triumph of the city was a book and he's doing mm. this massive project in downtown las vegas to transform it but basically triumph of the city says the greatest invention ever to mankind was the city was right. the urban. And the reason why is because it, it's where we saw most of our collisions and creations. Mm-hmm. And so I find that really intriguing. And, you know, he talks about the car being the most detrimental potentially because it allowed people to now travel further distances much yeah. farther than staying within an urban. And so, yeah, like it, it's funny when you look at historically, you look at cities of, of the great past, uh, you know, Rome and, and all of those cities and all the things that took place. And so mm-hmm. I, I've just, yeah, I fell in love with the concept of it. And so it's, it's funny. It's like, I feel like an obligation to do better every time. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And then that idea of culture, I think it's important. Like culture always evolves like almost daily. And we had a, a guest from Amsterdam, uh, one of our earliest guests, and she described how the Amsterdam we know now wasn't always that way. You know, like there's, there were actually, there was an actual campaign to stop cars from killing kids, which was the driver. And she actually talked about how the, there was almost a generation that they only knew cars. And it was the older generation that remembered what it was like before to be able mm-hmm. to describe it yeah. about what this could be and sort of going back to it. So it always changes. And young Dale too, when he does a really good job of describing how Copenhagen evolved from car center yeah. to not <laughs> totally yeah yeah and and i mean those challenges obviously i think again we're faced with every day like it's like oh well who's gonna bike in the winter time like why do we need the bike lanes yeah. i was talking to someone yesterday and he was telling me how you know he's a realtor at, at the remax office and just how how frustrating 
bicycles are. <laughs> and he's trying to convince me that bicycles should be on the sidewalks. And I said, you don't understand. It's, it's a transportation mode. Like people are using bicycles to get from somewhere and you, you, you view it as like, Oh, he's just having fun. Like, it's not culturally where we've been. And so there is a, it's a, it's almost like a revolution needs to take place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, you know, related, related to bike lanes and the units you're building and all those kinds of things, there's this interesting intersection. I haven't really seen a full articulation of it, but the, between infrastructure and culture mm-hmm. and how they're self-reinforcing, but culture is a lot more malleable than infrastructure is. For sure. So that's why getting the infrastructure right is so important because yeah. you, you might be stuck with it for a hundred years if you yeah. set and, it a certain way. And this is kind of our, our, like where I've taken time out of my days, like, and obviously I do have an inherent benefit, but I also think it's an inherent benefit for the future is we need the city to start investing in the city uh, and reinvesting in our communities that are already here that can benefit and draw more people and accept more people to benefit from existing infrastructure or upgraded infrastructure instead of focusing on on new infrastructure. Uh, and, and how do we make that a business case? It's always coming down to dollars and cents. So I like I don't know why we don't have that quite documented. But here clearly, like if we go and improve the infrastructure by X and we have this many much population increase, it will suffice to pay for for this infrastructure tenfold. Yeah. And so that business case is there. It just hasn't been well documented. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I truly believe it's what will actually help transform not only our city, but many of the cities. Yeah, that we look for at. sure. And, and one of the, one of the things that I, uh, I really appreciate about what round square has been doing. And I, I saw, can't remember where it was, but that you feel your role as a developer is to act as a steward of education for urban living. Can you expand on what you're up to and why, why you do that? Yeah. And so I think like, again, self, self-interested, but then also passion driven as I feel like the developer for a very long time has been shed to be something um, and kind of put into a box, like a typical, like this is what developers are here. You go to any engagement in session and every single developer is coined as a guy who's just here to make money and he doesn't have to live in this form or live with what he's left. And so he's in and out to get, get paid. And unfortunately, like you look at the industry and there's examples of that, you know, left, right, and center. There is examples of people who have built things that, will not stand the test of time that shouldn't have actually gotten built that don't meet the mandate of, 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 of good design or good community building. And mm. unfortunately, if you go through our established neighborhoods and our, in our, in our main streets as we've seen so much of it, um, I don't just blame the developers for this. I also think the city has a massive role. How did we prescribe the city and the community? Like, how do we prescribe what the requirements are for developers? Like, if you are so concerned with height and intensity and FAR. FAR refers to floor area ratio, which is a way to regulate the density of a building. The floor area ratio is the relationship of the total usable floor area of a building relative to the total area of the lot the building is on. So, for example, if the zoning of a piece of land said that the FAR was 2, that would mean the allowable floor area of the building would be twice the size of the lot it was on. It's like if you are so concerned with height and intensity and FAR and density and you craft this box of where we need to build form. And, and basically you, you stipen any sort of innovation by doing that. And this is my whole concern with Mm -hmm. policy planning in general is how do you policy plan, but still encourage innovation. And so when you say, well, okay, go build this max 14 meters, max FAR, here's what you can do. Well, how are you going to get left with anything else, but the form that they give you? Yeah. We can't continue to prescribe that because when I look at the design field and you look at architecture and you look at how quickly things are moving from an innovation perspective, um, it's changing so rapidly. And so how do we build policy that says this is what will be done? This is a written document and your community, you are now suffice because this is what we're going to do. Because I, I really don't believe that that's and, and nor do I want to be that guy. Like, I don't want to settle the policy. I don't want to like if you tell me we can only have this because of this, I'm going to go out and find cases or find experts that can show me why we can do something so much better. Mm-hmm. Because I just believe we need to continue to challenge the norm and push the threshold in order to create these vibrant places. We need to continuously evolve just like culture evolves, people evolve, but as well, building for the future is so, is so critical. Um, you know, 
when we put up a building, I'm not looking at like whether or not this is going to just go to market in two years. Obviously, it's important that that it sells. We need to sell. We need to make money. There has to be a financial viability behind our projects. But I want to believe that like when we're not here, people are going to come and be like, man, this building is amazing. I want to live in that building. Mm-hmm. I want, I can't wait for one of those buildings to go on sale. And so I think about like the Habitat 67s of the world. Habitat 67 is a residential complex in Montreal that was built for Expo 67. The building was designed by Moshi Safti and is an iconic cluster of 354 interconnected concrete boxes. To learn more about this historic structure, check out our show notes. And that that's what I want to put into every single one of our building is like with that full thought process, passion, engagement and quality that everyone eventually will want to be like, I want to find, you know, that round square project. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, I get asked all the time, like, what are the sustainable measures that you're putting into your places? And I, and I always say, well, the first one is you bet your ass that our places is not getting torn down in 50 to 100 years <laughs> yeah, because yeah. this thing is going to get marked like a, like I, I say this on every project. I want it to be a, you know, a, a design landmark. Mm-hmm. I want it to be heralded as something that they'll never want to tear down so people can continue to visit and experience what it's like and talk about what were the positives of those projects. Like, I feel like that's the rigor that we put in on the front end. Uh, And it doesn't always have to be expensive. It's not about money oftentimes. It's about time. It's the quality of time you put into the planning to have to live with these things. Mm-hmm. And so with, with some of the projects that you've really pushed uh, the design on, how, how do you, uh, I guess, from a, a business perspective, recon- reconcile the additional uh, often time, like if you're, you're trying to push outside of a policy box uh, or, you know, engage with a community that might be skeptical of your designs or things like that? Because that's, that's one of the things that the industry from a business perspective, it makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Like, here's the box, so I'm just going to work with that. Mm-hmm. And then it just, you know, least path of least resistance. And yep. then, then I can be sure to make my money as opposed to take that extra time. How do you, how do you reconcile that in, in your own business? Yeah, so I think, obviously, we've invested, we've invested heavily in planning. I think mm-hmm. the planning, the planning profession, I think we've yeah. taken a, we've taken a good stance on the fact that we see the value in planning, not only from being clear and concise on what our, what our position is and what our core values is and who we want to be, but how we convey that information. And then also having them almost be uh, partners with us to ensure that their, their, um, their policies and, and what they stand for is being represented in these projects. So they have accountability as well. Uh, like creating a sense of accountability, I think in the planning profession is really important. And I don't, I don't know if it exists right now. Uh, Cause you look at the scope. Yeah. Like what is the scope of a project that, you know, certain firms work on and then you see them way over here. And it's not to say like we right now where we have no interest in working in Greenfield, but it doesn't mean I don't think we, we don't want a voice in making Greenfield better because I, understand mm-hmm. the necessity of it but i think it's more about the core values of planning principles is something that i'd like to see more like i i want companies to stand for something i resonate when you stand for something i don't resonate when you're when you're afraid to take a stance and so you know i look to the companies that do that for us like it's not this is not a race to the bottom like we're not mm-hmm. we're not we're not looking to to capitalize maximum on every single project we know what we want to be at our investment group has kind of bought into our concept and where we feel we want to be in the long run mm-hmm. and why I think we're all excited is because there hasn't really been a shakeup for a while. Like the shakeup happens, you know, with architects. Um, and, and it usually happens on like what I call legacy projects or like city projects or yeah. billion dollar projects. Yeah. But, but for us, it's like, man, let, let's, let's provide this quality and this experience to the generalist public is kind of how I see it. Yeah. And so like that that's that's really what we're after is how how do we do that successfully Mm -hmm. and that's that's really encouraging too because you know by by the very nature of development you know the development industry you have impact you know it's it's much more distributed throughout a community so uh you know our new public library is obviously a treasure and a gem yeah and you expect and hope and wish for those kind of capstone projects to be that yeah but it doesn't ha- it shouldn't be 
you have to go downtown to see it to see good design Correct. integrated to the fabric of the community yeah. yeah yeah and i mean it's the other thing that i found really challenging when we first started was um is working with like the consultant professional industry mm. and it was more just like i never felt like it was a team mm, yeah, i felt yeah. like oh we did the design you guys did a piss poor job at executing the design yeah but we still created this amazing rendering you just couldn't deliver it well i couldn't I couldn't deliver it because it was never buildable. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? I could yeah, have yeah, never sure. built it to your vision because I still have to make this work for this price. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, then this will never happen. Yep. And so there's kind of this like dynamic relationship that has to form where everyone has to understand we need to be here, help work backwards now to figure out what the formula is to get there. Yep. And nothing is off the table with our group. It's like, we want to explore, we want to know how to get there, but we have to get there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you think about, you know, <laughs> I go into a firm and I say, like, show me what you've done. If you have a bunch of projects sitting on the shelf, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know if I'm inclined yeah, to work sure. with you because shelf sure. projects look great. Glad you can produce award-winning projects. Show me shit that actually got executed and built because yeah. that's what uh, excites me is, yeah, is yeah. can you actually show me things um, that have, that you've accomplished this on? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, the firm that we're working with really closely right now on quite a few projects um, is from Winnipeg 546. And, and I've been able to do that with them. Like really yeah. talk about this is where we want to be. Help us get there. And, and, you know, to, to their kudos to them because they look at this as a really team effort and they want to get as many of these built as they possibly can because mm -hmm. they believe in something and they stand for something and they're willing to work towards whatever they need to, to get it there. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and I, that's, you know, having been on a number of those teams that you describe, that's our biggest frustration and challenge is uh, here's your particular silo, here's your silo, and then go and complain about how, say, the municipal government has their silos. Well, you're operating the same way, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think too often, and what you're describing is, uh, you know, set the vision and then work towards it. Um, but uh, too much of uh, different professional groups, professions um, see things as mutually exclusive, you know, so good design means it's going to be super pricey, yeah. you know, like as, as one simple example. And I think that that's, um, you know, one of the encouraging things that you're pushing it, that it doesn't have to be a choice. It's a challenge to, to bring it together, but a worthwhile one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's the consistent thing is like, it's more challenging. It may take more time, which in, in essence does cost more money mm -hmm. for any developer. They're going to tell you, we need to execute on a time frame, yeah. on a, on, and so our whole objective is to build those times into our performance knowing that mm -hmm. we are planning to spend a bit more time right. Um, right. because we're planning to deliver something else. And so, you know, I was in another meeting um, a while back and one of the people in the meeting told me, well, you know, you don't have to deliver that type of project to this neighborhood. Like it can kind of be <laughs> this. And I just sat there and I, and I was like, man, no, like this is what's missing. Like the fact that there's this idea and that we can't, we can't deliver. Like I get what market is. So let me dictate what market can do. Like if I can't put Viking appliances in here, okay, I'll put KitchenAid. Yeah, I'll yeah. come up with that. But from an, from a really urban and high level 50,000 square feet up, I want to deliver excellent projects everywhere. Yeah. Like that's just the reality of it. I want to develop good parks, good public realms, and I want to build catalysts for people to have amazing experiences um, with the built forms and, you know, the things that we're doing. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we, when we look at our, the future of our business and where we're going, like structure and housing is actually only a component of, of where, where we feel like we influence and what right. our impact is. And so to me, that's just a foundational piece. Now, what we're really trying to figure out is how do we complete that idea of accessibility to the urban life? Mm -hmm. And so that's really our goal now, as we look at where are we moving in the next five and we, our whole thing is to really com complete urban living. It's not just to say, I'll build you this place. It's in the urban setting. There, there's a coffee shop over there that I'm going to highlight for you on a map and show you some amenities. But how do I actually get you to do it? Like, how do I actually get our people who are buying our places to really understand the benefits and force the benefits on them so they ev eventually 
absorb that into their daily lives mm. and so so what does that look like how, how do you how do you so what are some early yeah, ideas of so moving guess, that direction? yeah I, I'm, I'm pretty open about this just because i feel like if yeah, someone's yeah. going to do it I, I don't mind i think it's probably better for all of us if they do but we're, we, we launch round square life um probably in the third quarter uh here of 2019 and round square life for us is living it's about it's about how do we actually encourage people to live um a fulsome life and so a fulsome life for me is not in isolation not just in your unit and not just through great interior design and cool material palettes that's all going to happen we're going to keep doing that because we just love that stuff but now what i'm really focused on is like okay let's identify let's identify our community let's identify the fabric of our community Let's identify the small business within our community. Well, like, where do you like to go for a drink? Where do you like to go for a beer? Where do you like to go for your groceries? Where do you like to go for fitness? What are some of the things that happen in this community? And so we're now taking an approach on our buildings where we're not, we're not, we're not amenity heavy at all. We've actually stripped back our amenities. Our mm -hmm. buildings are now extremely efficient. And so we're not going to give you a place to wash your dog, a place to do yoga, a gym. Uh, we're not doing any of that. We're, uh, we're giving you stuff that encourages you to leave your building. Get out and do that. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah. in our building, you know, and, and this is going to be, uh, we're calling it our subscription based living, uh, and really targeted towards the millennials and the boomers, um, movement. Like how do we get you out? And so, you know, we, we're, we're looking at uh, the a bike program. So we'll have a bike room, communal bike room. We'll have an on-site manager that helps manage the communal bike program. We want to do a car sharing platform. So we have cars that are owned by the building that you can then access to go and take out. And then the biggest move that we're trying to make, which we haven't done yet, but is the goal is built-in experiences into your living. Hmm. And so the best way that I can kind of explain that is like you end up getting a place, you subscribe to a place, you go through a cultural guide. It's not, it's not a credit check. It's like a cultural check. Hmm. Does this fit? Like, are you willing to do the things that we're talking about doing? Cause this is what we're about here. So like, do you culturally want to be a part of this process, be a part of what we're, what we're hoping to do? And, and, and will you actually go out and do these experiences? Because I don't want to do all these things and then just have them sit on the shelf and nobody use them. Yeah. Right. Cause then it, we're not the right fit. And so how, how do we get max attrition for the experiences that we're creating? Hmm. Simplest way to say it is like in your, in your living uh, subscription, we want to basically give you the option to have a bike. Um, no, sorry, a coffee, a lunch, a dinner, a breakfast, uh, a fitness class, um, included in your base so okay. whatever yeah, you spend yeah. right, right. and so it's like okay you know that when you you know every month you're going to have the option to do all these different activities because they're pre-built into your into your actual base mm -hmm. so it allows us to then support all of these local businesses and communities it allows us to basically guarantee that we're going to have you know roughly uh, you know the building we're working on right now is 90 residential units we have a captive audience of a minimum, I would say 120 people in this building. I want them to come and see you once a month. What's the value right. to your business in that? Right. And how do I build that into my program so I can actually create that value for you, for us, and at the end of the day, for my homeowner, for you to basically absorb them as a customer. Mm -hmm. yeah, and right. so the whole idea is creating this idea of, of really living and encouraging movement, interaction, and experiences that we continue to talk about but how do we really create it? And so our idea to create it is we'll be the first, we'll, we, you know, we'll give you that feeling, you know, once a month or twice a month enough yeah. to get you into it. And then yeah, yeah. The, the job that I feel like, which is easy is that that business is then going to acquire you as a customer. And I want to bring your friends and your family and other people there. Cause um, we're hoping that that, that experience and getting you there in the first place will absorb you into this concept. Wow. That's really interesting. Like the, the word I keep thinking of when you're talking about that is just catalyze. You want to catalyze these kinds of activities and behaviors that will should only benefit the community at large. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so like, you know, you hear about the small businesses that often suffer because we don't have the density to support them in our city. Mm -hmm. Very cool businesses. We all love them as urbanists. We all go there. We buy our stuff from there, but there's just not enough critical mass. Yeah. And so when we bring that critical mass, how do we make sure it directly correlates to these businesses thriving. Yeah. And so, you know, I look at some of these buildings that have crazy amenities and I think about the small businesses around them. Like if you're building a yoga room, well, what about the yoga studio across the street? Mm -hmm. What's the idea with the yoga room? Who's going to use the yoga room? What is the actual attrition? If we go back and look at like how many people truly use the amenities? 
mm-hmm. the dog the dog washing station and all those yeah. things like yeah. are they really being fully utilized yeah um my feeling is no um they're not public amenities they're private amenities for building unit holders there's also a cost to maintain those amenities there's a cost to actually live in that building with that amenity and so my whole thing is like man i i'd rather pay that to the business yeah. I'd rather pay the yeah, yoga right. studio to serve my people yeah. because that person's sole business and focus is to create an environment to do yoga. In. Yeah. And I will never not only want to like hinder that or compete with that. I want to encourage that. Mm-hmm. I want our people to go mm-hmm. and do that and live that life. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, the examples you're giving like the yoga room or what have you, there's, you know, you could easily see the parallel to, you know, the stats you see about the private automobile, right? Like it's the average one, whatever it is, 97% of the time just sits there doing nothing and, that, that, and that, we all <laughs> own it. And yeah, yeah so, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you think about yeah. the operating costs and yeah, all those yeah. things that I'm like, well, why, why are we doing that? Why are we still yeah. doing that? And then, and then it's just cause that's the way it's done. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what we're used to. Yeah. And our our target our target audience might not come. You know what I mean? Yeah. They may come and be like, no. I don't want to ever leave my building. Yeah. Like I was told that I would never have to leave my building (laughs) in this city. And and, and that's what I was used to. And I thought I could just come home and do all the things I need to do my home and like never leave. And it's like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, then you're probably not the right fit. (laughs) And and, and I don't know how else to say that. Like fit where you live is kind of where we came up with the motto is like, this may not be for everyone. That's right. We'll do our best to encourage you, to explain to you, to really intrinsically show you from an educational perspective what the benefits are, but you have to believe in it. Yeah. And my, my feeling is is there is groups that, that definitely are suffering from isolation on, on our boomer side mm-hmm. that should benefit instrumentally from this. Yeah. Um, and then there's groups that, you know, on the millennial side that already have this in them. They want to mm-hmm. feel that sense of community. They want to be connected. They want to do things. And, you know, most of the amenities that I'm talking about that we have built up, uh, we see in, in, in currently in, in purpose-built rental, they're usually high-rise towers. And how many people do you see get into an elevator and have a conversation with their neighbors? Yeah. Like ever, that that's a neighbor. Yeah. Like you hear everyone talk about neighbors and neighbor day and lovely, lovely neighbors. But when you get into a high rise, why is there this lack of connection when you go vertical? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I don't even know the answer. Like, I'm always intrigued by it. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know why the elevator is such an uncomfortable environment. And so when we look at like the buildings that we're doing, all traditionally mid-rise and, you know, mid-rise in Calgary is like, oh, mid-rise is six stories max. It's like, no, not really. Mid-rise is, is 10 to 12 stories tops is how I see mid-rise. But, um, and so, but more than that, how do we create sense of community for people? Mm -hmm. Um, And I truly believe it doesn't, you can't just build it and think that it'll do it. Like we can't just build the most amazing building and hope that, that, that will do it. I think there is a responsibility on us uh, to continue to stay involved and program. Yeah. And so, interesting. and we, we, we plan to do that. We plan to have an inherent benefit on all of our projects yeah. that, that obviously there's a financial benefit, which allows us to then also take part in programming and continuing to, to further our mandate. Yeah. And so courtyard 33, the building that we're, we're doing in Marta loop, um, it's got 14,000 square feet of commercial, a public courtyard that's access to the public. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the feedback that we got early on through our engagement was, well, this courtyard's not going to work. No one's going to want to go in there. It's going to be too small. And just just all the negative things that could go wrong, you're not going to have the businesses that want to go on there. And we actually already do have some amazing businesses, but more so that, guess what? Like, we still own the courtyard. Like right. it's, it has a city access agreement te- technically is a public space, mm. but we can still be a part of the long-term care maintenance and programming of this space. Right. And so we're already thinking about like, okay, you know, let's do a pop-up brunch every Sunday. Let's try to bring in like a market collective that could come in and let's try to figure out how we activate space rather than just putting it there and hoping people come and use it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the sort of, you can't the the idea of building community is often uh planners will say well we got our policy all down we've done our part buyers it's up to you you know like it's and so again this is a, not an either or yeah like you're staying involved to help catalyze community and totally. open pathways for people to find their own yeah. community yeah and, and yeah. not to That's say there isn't great examples of of parks and places totally that but, are but amenities. again there's there's many pieces to this puzzle for yeah. sure yeah 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 and, to, and, and what you're describing is an active participation in it other than totally here's your unit hand off the keys and yeah and i mean you I've can seen, find us on our website you see it with like cmlc <laughs> right like cmlc stands for Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. 
They're a wholly owned subsidiary of the city of Calgary. CMLC has recently revitalized the city's East Village neighborhood, which includes the new Central Library and many other impressive projects. We've included links to these projects in our show notes. They have great amenities just based locationally, and they have some of the critical mass. Um, and so even them, though, like when they're activating their spaces, even though they already have the people mm-hmm. there and they already have like the great river walk and they have all these cool things, but they're still creating programming yep. to help further activate those spaces. Get people used to being in that yeah, space, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. When those spaces are ready, our, yep. our attractions, yep. like we, we technically, we should already be going to these places because they are are amazing right yeah but like you know when you think about like how do i get someone to believe that coming all the way up to marta loop if you're living in the mm-hmm. east village is worth it well it's not just because there's a courtyard there and you can come linger in that setting it has to be more it's yeah. kind of how i how i perceive that yeah for sure um okay so one question i, I wanted to get um to chat with you about quickly is is in your experience, what are the biggest misconceptions that people have about developers? It's it's the kind of line of work that uh, people have opinions of. Yeah. Uh, what what are some of the biggest misconceptions and that, that you could uh, so if you could correct? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just like I could go on. Um, I think it's like I think it's the lack. It's that we don't care. I think is the number one. Is that it? That it always comes up. It's like developers just don't care. Mm-hmm. They're just here to turn and move and profit. And I think that that that's a common one. Is 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 so huge. And so you get pinned in this evil in this evil kind of limelight all the time. When I walk into any kind of engagement and people are angry and they want they don't understand and there's why is there change and the they're just looking to get paid. And some of the things that I like I've had said about me personally, like already mm. is just crazy. Mm. And I get it. I, it's a part of the, the job, the territory and what it comes with, but it's like, I don't, I don't, I find it so overwhelming. And I think the one thing that I've said is like, we're, we're collaborators. Like we're, we're willing to collaborate. Mm. We want to work with people. We want to try to explain what we see as a benefit. And, and, and oftentimes I get told that you're, we're like forcing, we're forcing like change on people. Like they don't want that kind of change. Like it's like, I, I don't want, I don't want people here. I don't want more people here. Mm. We don't need more people here. Like they can go somewhere else. Mm. It's kind of the frustrating thing. And I think that it's hard to collaborate in that environment. Yeah. And so yeah, what I've sure. really told, what I've told everyone um, when I meet with communities and communities that I've tried to be involved in is like let's focus on the things that we can impact Mm -hmm. like if if someone comes in and you know they're they are set and policy and planners and everyone is showing and trending towards the fact that this is going to get approved instead of taking the hard well no we're going to fight this to the death let's rally let's get Mm -hmm. signs let's go up let's figure out how we can create the best outcome Mm -hmm. Because if this is where we're moving towards, um, you know, towards a project of this scale, scope, magnitude, let's focus on how we create the best outcome for Mm -hmm. our communities and for our people and for the public in the city. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my, my, my keystone advice to anyone working with anyone in the development industry. Instead of just hard knowing it. Or instead of saying like, nah, this, this, like, you know, this height is way too tall or the shadow impact is way too crazy. Well, why don't, why don't we like, and I think this would help planners and I think it would help at the city. I think it would help, you know, counselors, politicians, if we just focused our, our concerns collectively on something else. And then you might even see more developer buy Mm-hmm. You might even see them coming to the table more frequently and having those conversations and working collaboratively towards better outcomes because they don't feel like they're getting pitchforked on any yeah, right. conceptually right. on any project. Yeah, and right. so really focus on the urban, like how do we create places for the public? Because that's generally why the communities are are, are typically there, right? Yeah. What is the impact to me? Like, mm-hmm. I don't. You know, there there is a visual implication. Obviously, I I I have a different visual impact implication than 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 you might. And so, how do we in, ensure that the visual is not all that we're concerned about, but the urban experience holistically? How yeah. do we create those better environments? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's and you know, in our experience, having um, uh, leading engagement processes on behalf of uh, developers. Um, yeah, you can, the, the, the starting point of the conversation is it just feels entirely different than if we're doing something for a nonprofit or a municipal government, like they, they come in, you know, with their, 
yeah. hands up ready to scrap right away so you always you just continual work at, at getting people to think constructively and and so if if this person has or this company has bought this piece of land they want to do something with it how do you get the best outcome instead of this should just be a park yeah. you know like so so just work with what you know and the city and their city plan has said we're going to try and get more people living in the inner city like put all those pieces together and then that's that's you know like what we do and you know what you've done like that's our job to educate folks to let it, like this is the direction the city's heading in and so how do we make that happen so yeah yeah i get it totally it. yeah, yeah it's there right right there right it, yeah. it's, it's it's in the yeah. pudding and so i feel like we're we're getting there i've seen mm-hmm. some great stuff and you know to to the development industry again like specifically like let's let's be accountable like let's take accountability mm. now let's let's try to be better ourselves it's yeah, kind of what sure. i've told my peers is you know, and sometimes I get, I get, and the other side, I'm getting pushed yeah, yeah. out of the room. Like, man, that guy's so annoying. Like, why is he always talking about this stuff? Like, we're, we don't want to do that. Like, you want to do that? Go ahead, do what you want. But we're going to continue to do it this way. Yep. All I can say to that is then, well, then communities, like, continue to continue to battle. Like, yeah, have your armor. Like, go after projects like that. City of Calgary, have policy that prevents that from happening, please. Because... Mm-hmm. I don't want it to happen anymore just as much as they don't want it to happen yeah, anymore. Sure. And so how do we better prepare ourselves to prevent those kind of things yeah. from happening? And we haven't done a good enough job on that because we've been so micro focused on, we want nothing or we want it to look <laughs> like this. And yeah. now we've got that. And now we hate those things. And so we're caught in this whirlwind of like, yeah, everybody's kind of like, nobody's happy and, and it's back to the developers are responsible for putting up those things that they did. But no, let's all take some accountability and responsibility mm-hmm. here. Why do those buildings look the way they do? Why don't they create the play settings that we hope they do? Because we're all stakeholders. We're all engaged. I consider us all partners. Yeah. I consider my planner, the city of Calgary, a partner in our development. Mm-hmm. I feel like the ultimate success of our projects are based on their ability to write planning, write policy, case make, help engage in the process. And so we all should be able to take accountability for our losses and our wins. Yeah. I feel like we have a lot of losses and we need to start winning. Mm-hmm. And the only way we can do that is if we can start to collaborate. More. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh, okay. So last question that we ask all the guests. Yeah. Can you tell us a city you love and why you love it? <laughs> can I? Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> I, I want to talk about like, obviously the most obvious ones, but I'll talk about one that I've had, um, and we're now doing work and I've had a chance to be there more frequently. Winnipeg. Yeah. 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 So I've, uh, I've never been to Winnipeg, uh, two years ago was the first time I'd ever been to Winnipeg. Yeah. And, um, I had always heard like the mosquito is the national bird. I think they called it. <laughs> and like, there's nothing there. They built a cool airport, but don't bother going in. And this is from people who live in Winnipeg, like <laughs> friends who now lived in Calgary. And I was like, man, eh, I'm never going to go there. And I it was like, I'd pass over to the airport anyways, through meeting you had, and and being forced to go there to look at it i was literally like compelled uh on a number of different fronts the exchange district Mm -hmm. um from a heritage perspective is absolutely incredible i've never seen anything like that before uh just especially in canada like a a a massive amount of, of heritage that's not even kind of like um i don't think it's even valued anymore in Winnipeg as highly as you would think mm. because they're just, just so it. normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, uh, you know, they're, they're like we, we have tons of banks like that. And I'm like, man, that is magnificent that that thing is still standing and looking like that. And so understanding the history of how Winnipeg grew, um, when it busted, how no one came back and did anything. And mm. so some, some incredible heritage. And then obviously to see the progression of the urban um, realm there and um I think like the architecture was kind of really compelling for me. Very cool. Yeah, sweet. Well, First time so much. heard Winnipeg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no, it was great. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Okay. I really appreciate the work Al and his team are doing at Round Square. It's inspiring to see developers that are doing things differently, both in terms of the built form they're developing, as well as the innovative ideas for building and supporting community. The company has a strong set of values that guides their decision making, which has led to more progressive ideas of city building being realized in Calgary. This conversation highlighted the relationship between policy, regulation, and the built form of our cities. And the way policy and bylaws are developed can stimulate or hinder innovation and thoughtful development. 
And in future episodes, we'll dive into how the devil can be in the details when it comes to how regulations influence how our cities are built. 360 Degree City is created by our team at Intelligent Futures. To learn more about the work we do, go to intelligentfutures.ca. I'm John Lewis. Thanks for stopping by.